Hello, this is Dean Kernut, and welcome to the Alpha Exchange, where we explore topics in financial markets associated with managing risk, generating return, and the deployment of capital in the alternative investment industry. My guest today on the Alpha Exchange is Harry Markopoulos. As everyone knows, Harry was the man who knew, according to 60 Minutes. Harry spent eight plus years chasing the Madoff Ponzi scheme, trying to alert regulators of what was happening. Harry, welcome to the Alpha Exchange. Great to be here, Dean. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy you made yourself available. We are a week away from the 10-year anniversary of the uncovering, the, the implosion of the Madoff scheme, where he turned himself in first to his family, and then his family went to the authorities. So it was December 11th of 2008, and it's a day that amidst the catastrophe was that was the financial crisis. I'll never forget that day because I was on a, on a train going to meet a buddy of mine in Stanford, and I was sitting on the train, checking my BlackBerry, looking at headlines, and out popped the one on Madoff. Giant Ponzi scheme has turned himself in. And I will truly never forget that moment because <laughs> instantaneously what popped into my mind was, I just said to myself, Mark Apollos. And, <laughs> you know, Harry, I remember meeting in, in 2002 in Boston. We had a plenty interesting conversation about volatility and skew and Variant swaps, I think, was a topic we focused on. And on my way out the door, you turned to me and you said, any familiarity with Fairfield Century? And I said, kind of rings a bell. You said, Madoff. I said, okay, yeah, yeah, I, I think so. You just, as plain as day, said, yeah, that's a fraud. You said, I'm 99.9% I'm sure that's a fraud. There's a tiny potential that there's a front running going on with his market making business. But no, I'm, I'm certain it's a fraud. And that just stuck with me, obviously, for, for a long time. So again, I want to thank you for being on. We got a lot to, to dive into. And I think it's just, as we approach this 10-year anniversary, there's just a lot of perspective. And I think lessons, again, to be learned as to how something like this that could materialize and then sort of perpetuate itself for, for many, many years. As we get started, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself? You have a military background that I think, as I've read your book now twice, I think it's influenced you in a large way and, and might have been a part of what made you able to chase this fraud for, for so many years. But just tell us a little bit more about your background, where you're from, and then how you, you know, came to, to serve in the military as well. I grew up in Erie, Pennsylvania, in western PA, in the northern part along the Great Lake Erie. Very cold up there. They had over 200 inches of snow last year, so it's a hardy people. And I, I tried to join the military I tried as an enlisted man when I was 17 because I liked the outdoors, hunting and fishing. But my parents wouldn't sign giving me permission to do so. So they said, you have to go to college. So I'm a freshman in college, my first week in school. And I see people in uniform walking through the campus. So I followed them, and I found the Army ROTC headquarters. And I immediately enrolled, and my parents were okay if I went in the Army as an officer, as long as I finished college. And so that's what I did. So I started at age 17, and I got out when I was 38 years old. I put 17 years in as a commissioned officer. I volunteered to be an infantry officer. I commanded a rifle platoon of 26 men for my first assignment in the Maryland Army National Guard. We moved down to Baltimore by that time. And I spent 10 years in the 29th Infantry Division which is the Maryland, Guard, Maryland and Virginia National Guard unit. And then I moved up to Connecticut to take a job at a hedge fund. And I joined a reserve Army Special Operations unit. It was a civil affairs unit in Danbury, Connecticut. So I had some wonderful training. It gave me good discipline. It taught me how to collect human intelligence, gave me a lot of self-confidence, a lot of leadership training, and certainly how to write a report. It's understandable for people of all ages and backgrounds because in the military, you have boot recruits that are age 17 to very senior officers and everybody in between with differing educational backgrounds. So you have to write clearly and concisely. And the Army gave me a lot of self-confidence to do an operation like that, and to plan it, plan it correctly, and to set up a network of human intelligence gatherers to help me in the Madoff case. And, and that certainly was the case. That's what turned, that turned out to be the key points in helping us solve this riddle. 
that was Bernie Madoff. It seems to me that that discipline and, and the ability to marshal the resources from a team standpoint seems to be quite critical in, in the way in which you organized your team and just pursued the every last nook and cranny of detail. Maybe we'll, we'll come back to that because I just think it's an overriding character trait with, with you and probably members of your team as well that made a lot of this possible. You mentioned the hedge fund in Connecticut. Tell us a little bit more about how you got interested in, in finance and how you came about to develop expertise in, in the derivatives market as well. I started my career, I didn't know what I wanted to do in college, so I majored in business. I changed my major a few times, changed schools, and you know the old saying, change your underwear, change your luck, well, that's not really true. You should just stick with something, but I didn't know. And so I, I, I switched around, and I, I tried restaurants. I didn't like that. I actually worked for United Parcel Service, unloading trucks, loading trucks, driving. That wasn't for me. I tried the military part-time in the Guard and Reserve. That wasn't for me on active duty. I really did enjoy my reserve service, though. So I tried many things, and I finally fell into finance. My dad bought a quarter interest in a brokerage firm in Pennsylvania near Philly, and so I moved there, and they, they lost their registered options principal, and they needed somebody that was good at math that could pass the Series 4 registered options principal exam. And so I fit that bill. I took a securities training course over a weekend, studied for a week, passed the options principal exam, and started trading options for clients. And I had one favorite client that was from a hedge fund. He was at Kidder Peabody's asset management arm. And he was leaving in June of 1988 to go off on his own. So I asked, because he was my favorite client, if I could join him. And he said yes. So six weeks later, I moved up to Greenwich, Connecticut. And I was working at a hedge fund as an assistant portfolio manager. And it was an equity derivatives hedge fund. So I got a lot of training up there and spent three years in Greenwich as an assistant portfolio manager before taking a job in Boston as a portfolio manager for Rampart Investment Management in Boston's financial district. And the rest is history. So this hedge fund that you joined, this is pre-VIX. It's post the big 87 crash. So I think at least after that point, folks had decided that there might be a justification for some downside skew in the you know, level of implied volatility for, for puts versus calls. That wasn't as apparent in 1987. If you remember the crash, we really didn't have skew. We didn't really know that out-of-the-money puts should have a different volatility than an out-of-the-money call. Things were priced wrong back then. People thought we knew about options, but we really did. didn't. Were you in the equity derivative space when, when the market crashed, or was that slightly before you're, you're hitting that desk? It was several months before hitting that desk. My first day as a licensed Series 7 was Monday, October 19th, 1987. <laughs> And so my job at the, at the firm was to answer calls because my firm's clients were actually short a lot of the over-the-counter names you know, that were falling rapidly in price. And so we were buying to cover short. And so everybody on Wall Street wanted to call us because we would, number one, answer our phone. And number two, we would buy something that they definitely wanted to sell because there was certainly a liquidity crisis. People wanted cash. They wanted to be out of stocks as quickly as possible. And so we were big buyers closing out positions for our particular clientele. So we were very busy, and all I would do is set up the phone calls, and I would find out what security they wanted to sell and what price they were willing to sell at, and I would set up the call and list their broker number. And back then, the NASDAQ, you'd have a four-letter clearing identifier. I would write that down and set up the trade ticket for our traders to take the call and consummate the trade. So that was my welcome to the industry. I was looking at, at the... <laughs> My first day was a rather exciting day. That's a busy start. <laughs> That's some first day. Well, it was actually a first day and a first night because then we had to clear those trades. And if you remember the backlog on clearing, uh, computers weren't set up to handle that volume of trading, of course. And so it took us, oh, we would work nights and weekends trying to clear the days, clear the trades. And if you remember, I think we had some reduced hours or something back then. I can't remember. It's, it goes back many years. But we had to clear those trades, and it took a long time. Things were supposed to trade T plus three, and oftentimes it was T plus four or five or six sometimes. And we had a lot of DKs, but we had to resolve all those. And I think everybody on Wall Street worked really hard, and we minimized the uncleared trades. I think everybody did a great job pitching in and working hard. Your first role in equity derivatives at the hedge fund, was it a 
arbitrage type strategy? What was the kind of mechanics of what the fund was was trying to accomplish? It was a five and twenty fund. We charged it five, but I, I want to I want to explain that the five was five basis points management fee, not five percent. I wish, and twenty percent of the carry, and it was a short vol strategy. Mainly, it was call selling against the OEX index, and sometimes the S and P index. Back then, they also had probably remember this. The XMI major market index was a 20 stock index that traded on the American Stock Exchange that tried to replicate the Dow Jones Industrial 30 average. So we traded mainly those three products. So it was totally a short vol, one sided strategy, calls only. And it was incremental return strategy. And my boss ran it for many years. I, I stayed there for three years before moving to Boston. And your start at Rampart was mid 90s? Is that when you began at Rampart? I joined there in October. 1991 and stayed through the last day of August 2004. And I, and I left mainly because of the Madoff case. I figured there was so much fraud on Wall Street. And if you're an equity derivatives guy, you're really good at math. And you know what the frauds are because you can diagnose just about anything. And so I said, you know, I think I want to be on the other side of this industry. I think I can do better because there's no one out there hunting the big game. And I figure from the only one hunting game that's not been hunted, I should be naturally successful. And it turned out that I was both right and wrong. I was right on the career choice. I was wrong on the timing, and there was no vehicle to monetize my skill set at that point in time. It had a Madoff case had to happen, and then I had to testify before Congress and, and recommend a whistleblower program, which the SEC embraced and which Congress passed as part of the Dodd-Frank legislation in the summer of 2010, and that allowed me to monetize my skill set and do quite well career-wise. So it's almost good karma that ultimately this has led to an actual career path, a real new one that you've effectively been a part of essentially pathbreaking down a new road. Your experience at Rampart in the 1990s, was this a firm that also was employing some overwriting strategies? Is that my understanding is that they were among the firms that were managing overwriting portfolios for clients in the early days? Yes, they used a Brignoli model. And it basically, it just set up the roll ratio. And it was a incremental income strategy with short ball, short calls, but it was on individual equities, whereas my previous form was short the calls on the indexes, which was, I think, quite a different strategy. And I did that for many years at Rampart. We also branched off into put spreads, call spreads on the indexes some buy right indexes. We were the first firm. That was the first firm to trade the buy right index on the CBOE. And so they started pioneering other strategies to diversify away from just short calls against individual stocks. And when is it that with respect to, to Madoff, so let's maybe, well, let's go down this road here. You, you essentially were tasked with the impossible challenge of replicating, mimicking the, the outcomes from his portfolio. You, you were charged with coming up with a strategy that your firm could utilize to market and raise lots of capital around, some of which was simply to be a diversifier away from Madoff, right? What the, the original goal was, if we could do something that's even close, these folks have a lot of this in the portfolio, Madoff in the portfolio already, they'd benefit from just some diversification. Is that correct? Is that how the original challenge came to you? Yes, Access International was a major feeder into Madoff, and they managed about $1.6 billion with Madoff, and they wanted a diversifier. And they said, well, Rampart, can you figure out a similar strategy that gives us Madoff-like returns, but a different strategy, so we can diversify, not have all our eggs in one basket, because they were heavily concentrated with Madoff. And so my firm said, yes. And so I was tasked to look at it. And so I sent Frank Casey down to New York and he picked up some Madoff literature, including a one page tear sheet. And I looked at it and I knew right away in five minutes it was a Ponzi scheme. Either that or it could have been front running. And so I had to do some research and I quickly figured out that this was too big to be front running. If you're front running, Madoff wouldn't have been doing that. And the reason is he wouldn't have been taking in more assets under management. And the reason is, more AUM increases your risk of being detected because you're front running more and more. And so it's easier to catch you. And the second thing it does that's not very nice, not a, not a good strategy, is it lowers your return on invested capital. 
So it does two things you don't want. It increases your risk of detection because you're trading too much size when you're front running. And number two, it lowers your return on invested capital. Two bad things. And so I knew it wasn't front running. I knew it had to be a Ponzi because his returns were basically up at a 45 degree angle. And we don't have 45 degree angles in finance. They exist in trigonometry and geometry. They might exist in physics, but not in finance. We don't get 45 degree return lines. So I wish I could say it was more simple than that or more complex than that. I wish I could say that, but it really wasn't. And then I just took the monthly returns and the returns were too steady. And that was the other thing. There was an absence of volatility. So the sharp ratios were close to 3x. And how do you have a, a sharp ratio of three over a long time period in finance? You can't. You might be able to dominate the market's short term with a great trade that goes your way for many months, maybe a year, maybe a year and a half. But you can't do it year after year after year. And so Madoff was clearly impossible, to my, my way of thinking. So I took the monthly returns. And there were only seven down months. And the largest monthly loss was a mere 55 basis points. Well, Dean, you've traded derivatives. So have I. I could lose 55 basis points in a couple seconds. Uh, I, could, I could lose a lot more than that in a few minutes. And Bernie's only down 55 basis points for his worst monthly loss. I didn't think that that was possible at all. And so I took a look at his statistics, and I, I saw that his correlation to the U.S. stock market, the S&P 500, was 6%, a 0.06. Well, that's the same thing as being uncorrelated to equities, a market where he purported to make his returns. And I knew that wasn't possible. Your returns could not be coming from the equity market if you're uncorrelated to the equity market. And so mathematically, this thing was an obvious fraud. What are the conclusions you might offer just on human nature, the human condition of falling vulnerable to these things or folks having a strong suspicion, but it never becoming anything more than just that? For something like this to perpetuate itself for so long, what does it say about maybe the willingness to believe <laughs> in things that are unbelievable? Like, how would you frame that part of it? I would say it was a different time and a different era where people trusted financial institutions a lot more than they do now after the global financial crisis. And one of the things was the fear of missing out. Mm. And Madoff was far bigger in Europe than he was here in the United States. So there are roughly, he was in over 40 countries. And the source for this is Who Invested with Madoff by George Martin. He's a hedge fund manager. He was also a adjunct professor of finance at the University of Massachusetts, so he's close. And he wrote in the Journal of Alternative Investments in the summer of 2009. He did an analytical piece, and he, he identified 339 fund of funds and 59 management companies invested with Madoff from over 40 countries, of which 79 were in the U.S., and there were over 200 in Europe. Bernie was much bigger in Europe, and the Europeans felt it was a God-given right earn 15 to 20 percent returns in a year with very little volatility. And so if Bernie's offering 12 percent with very little volatility, they were all into that. They thought that that existed because they didn't know any better. They're not that sophisticated in finance. Take a look at the investment banks on the continent. They all struggle, don't they? Royal Bankruptcy of Scotland had to take a bailout from the British government. Barclays blew itself up. The French banks, they had great difficulty in the global financial crisis, and they're probably still licking their wounds. Deutsche Bank is near insolvency and probably needs a bailout. And we, we saw what happened at UBS. They took, what, a $61 billion bailout from their central bank. And so the Europeans fell for this hook, line, and sinker. In the U.S., not quite as much. Only 79 out of 740 fund of funds actually fell victim to Madoff. That was about 10.7% where in Switzerland, 77 feeders out of 267 fund of funds had made off. So that was almost a 29% exposure rate. In Italy, it was 35%. In Germany, it was almost 17%. The only place that really did better than the U.S. from a due diligence standpoint on avoiding made off was the U.K. About 9.5% of their fund of funds managers had made off exposure. In Europe, they have quite a strong private banking network whether it's through money centers like Zurich or sometimes 
through Germany, the sort of old money that gets allocated. In the U.S., it seemed that Madoff was really not successful at all with most of the large banks. In fact, a number of them had him on a you know, do not invest list after doing some of their own due diligence. But one of the things you point out in the book is he expertly exploited or created an, an affinity scheme. Tell us just a little bit about how, how you think about that and, and just how he was able to, unfortunately, lure in people that were, you know, preconditioned to, to trust him. Well, Bernie, he's Jewish, so he naturally reached out to his own people. And people wrongly think that this is an American Jewish case. And it is. That's how it started, but that's not how it ended up. He was quickly going to run out of American people of the Jewish faith. And so he expanded to other affinity groups. He went with the European royalty to the private client banks in Europe. And he, he probably took down at least half of the royal families in Europe. So he was able to expand into Catholics, Protestants. He was just getting started in Asia when his scheme collapsed. He was big in Latin America, which is you know, mainly Catholic countries. So he got to expand certainly beyond just his own affinity group. I just finished a case right before Thanksgiving against a person who is scamming Indian tribes in casinos. And so I turned that in as a Ponzi scheme. And there are all sorts. Right now I'm working on one that's scamming Christian evangelicals. And so everybody goes after their own first, but Madoff, he needed other ethnic groups and other nationalities to keep his scheme running. And that's why there were far more Catholic and Protestant victims, especially overseas. And certainly he had a lot of different nationalities that he was scamming. Like I said, he was in over 40 countries. So it's not just an American case. And one of the things that in the aftermath of this, you, you were shocked to see the tentacles as spread as far and wide as they wound up being, you were very focused on a lot of the European fund of funds, but the sheer number of accounts down to smaller accounts, I think you communicated as just being so far in excess of what you could have imagined. I don't know what the actual number is, but there seem to have been thousands of investors, individual investors as well. That's true. I never, We never saw the South African money coming in, and obviously it was there. And certainly we didn't see the Chinese money. Bernie had just got set up in Singapore, Taiwan, and Hong Kong. And so he hadn't really reached big time into mainland China, but that would have been his next frontier. And he did have a few marketing ties to mid-sized players in Japan. We never saw that coming in. So he was, he was starting to get big in Asia, but in Europe is where we were tracking him. And what was odd there was the French fell to Madoff like moths to a flame. I would say that in Geneva, which is very Francophile, Almost everybody had Madoff. So that was about $14 billion worth of Madoff money coming just from Geneva. So that devastated the asset management industry in Geneva, where the people in Germany, I'm sorry, the people in Zurich were very wary of Madoff, and they had their suspicions, and they sort of stayed away in Zurich. So even within the same country, you had that divide between Madoff investors and people that were wary of Madoff. I would say most of the continent was invested with Madoff, less so in the UK because they're a little bit more sophisticated than they are in the continent. And we never saw the Asian money. We were tracking Madoff very closely through Europe and North America, and we never bothered with the other, the other places, especially Asia. We just never saw it. We were flabbergasted to see that he was so big worldwide. What, what percentage of the capital was through the, the feeder fund construct, roughly speaking? Ernie started off handling individual accounts, and that got him up into the hundreds of millions and maybe got him into the single digit billions. But the only way he can get to $64.8 billion notional in that quick of a period of time was through feeders. And his brilliance there was he knew the Wall Street saying that little pigs get fat and big pigs get slaughtered. And so his workaround there, because what, what a policy scheme is, is nothing but a liar with a bank account. And so the only thing you're really managing each day is your checking account. And he did. He had a checking account, a 704 checking account at J.P. Morgan. So you need a bank to aid and abet you in a Ponzi scheme. And J.P. Morgan was aiding and abetting. And they pled guilty to five criminal counts in 2014, I believe it was. And they paid a $2.6 billion criminal fine, which is going to victim restitution. 
And so Madoff was managing his cash account very, very closely. And that was pretty much all he had to focus on was looking for new sources of money. And the way he did it was he offered a deal that you couldn't refuse. He's giving your clients double-digit return. He's pretending to earn 16% growth on average to deliver 12% net to your client. 4% difference between the growth and the net is your marketing spread. And I believe that Bernie gave over 90% of that 4% to his feeder fund. And so you're getting paid to put money into a product that everybody is willing to sign up for. This is a product that writes its own order tickets for you. All you are is an order taker. You don't even need to sell this product. And so people are reaching for it because they think it's real, 12% with a sharp ratio of three, with 4% vol. What do you think? Who's going to turn that down? And the answer was very, very few people. And so that's how it spread is Bernie overpaid you know, typically for marketing, you're going to get 15 to 50 percent, depending on what kind of distribution you can provide someone like Madoff. And Bernie, here's Bernie giving 90 percent of the fees to people that are marketing. So he's overpaying for marketing, and that's why this the scheme blossomed and grew so big so quickly. And that's a really interesting one. When you look at the ratio of profitability, or at least supposed profitability, for the feeder funds versus Madoff, which I understand was just getting paid the commission, right? Was happy to just trade. That to me is a real red flag. And then when you think about the feeders themselves, they're looking at that as well, right? They're looking at that, the, the economics being so heavily skewed towards them. What's your sense is there were so many of these feeder funds basically extracting 90% of the profitability themselves versus Madoff. What's your sense from those feeder funds in terms of how they thought about that. It had to have been something that they had to have confronted from a, is, does this make sense standpoint? You would have thought, and I would have thought, and we would have been wrong because Bernie is making all those feeder funds rich, rich beyond their wildest dreams. And so everybody wants to believe they're smart and are working hard for that money. And so they had a rationale. Well, Bernie doesn't want to be bothered with clients. Clients are a pain in the ass. He just wants to manage the money and just earn the commission. And if they would have looked closely at the commission structure, they would have noticed that it was quite different. You and I would see it immediately. He was charging, I think it was $4 a contract yeah. and a penny per share commission. In share equivalents, one number is four times higher than the other, isn't it? Right. He never could do options math. Yeah. <laughs> That's the ridiculous thing. He was just pretending to do options math. And he would say that his director of options trading, trading is Frank C. Pasquale, which was great. He's from New Jersey. He has a high school diploma. That's not typically who heads the options trading desk on Wall Street, is it? Right. His trade tickets, the, what he would report, was he reporting both stock executions and OEX options executions as well? Yes, he was. And the other thing that was odd about him on his statements, He's pricing the equities out three decimal places, but the last decimal place is always a zero. He's only going out two decimal places, and he's trading mega billions of stock. Who does that? You know, I used to price out eight decimal places for a three and a half billion dollar account because I wanted to be to the penny. Bernie's managing way more than I was, so he probably needed to be out I don't know sixteen decimal places, and he's only going out two. And he's telling you that he's average pricing, which made no sense at all. And then the other thing that was odd about him is he's able to buy stocks at their lows and sell them at the highs. Who does that? Well, someone with a north of three sharp ratio, I suppose. <laughs> it was pretty clear to me that he was typing in his returns. It's the only way that those, those returns were achievable. Right. And the other stories he's telling people are that I actually do lose money in some months, but I subsidize it out of my profits because I don't want you to show large losses or any kind of losses to your clients that might scare them away. And so I'm a charitable guy. I cover those losses. And a lot of people believe that. He was covering losses, which no one does that on Wall Street. No one. Wall Street's not a charitable institution. That's just not what we do. When you first looked at the return stream, obviously you had a very, very strong view on the impossibility that something like this could be 
generated with so much consistency over such a long period of time. But you also set out under the direction of management at Rampart to try to build something that mimicked or, or was some version of a substitute for the strategy. I know there was a lot of frustration that you and your team had because you were up against something that was you know, not replicable. What was that process like? When did you set about to actually you know, get into the spreadsheets and start crunching a lot of numbers and try to replicate some version of, of this strategy? Was that around 2000 or when, when was that period? Oh, late 99 to early 2000. And we spent a lot of time, or actually wasted a lot of time, trying to replicate a strategy that couldn't be replicated because it, it wasn't real. And, and that was pretty readily apparent. I mean, I knew in the first few hours that this thing was fraudulent and that there was no way that this was ever going to be a real product. But, you know, my bosses and a lot of people in the industry, I would say most of the industry, had a lot of respect for Mr. Madoff. And they thought that this guy was a brilliant. And he was telling everybody he was brilliant. He was bragging that he was one of five co-founders of NASDAQ, the Electronic Computerized Trading Market for the 21st Century. And everybody believed him, except I know I didn't believe him because he was sending out, this is the most computerized guy on Wall Street with the fastest trading algorithm. And he's sending out his statements on green bar paper after the year 2000. In the new millennium, the most computerized guy is on green bar paper using a dot matrix printer. I didn't think that that was very computerized. And he's only pricing out two decimal places, and he's able to buy stocks at the lows and sell them at the highs. And, you know, I'm thinking, well, here's some more simple math. Stocks can go in three directions. They can go up, they can stay the same, or they can go down. Bernie is buying individual stock baskets, trying to replicate the OEX stock index, and he's only using 30 to 50 names to replicate that index. So he's taking single stock concentrated risk. So he's, which is not smart because in a derivative sense, what we would do is we'd buy the whole basket in the index weights, wouldn't we? Because we don't want to have a correlation problem. We don't want, because we know that that's going to bite us in the ass. At some point, it's going to hurt us. And so Bernie is buying put options on the OEX index, or so he says. Yet he is taking single stock concentrated risk positions. So he needs stocks. He needs to be taking stocks that only go up or stay the same, but never go down. And I knew that that's not possible. No one can do that. And so his math failed there because he had an imperfect hedge on. His core strategy was to buy these stocks and essentially wrap a collar around around the stocks. And that Correct. was really nothing more than that. When you guys started to try to build a competing product. Was it down that same path? Was that what you were thinking as well? Or were there other permutations that you guys thought of? Well, it was clear that you shouldn't be taking single stock concentrated positions. That you should just own the index. And so the way we modeled it was, I want to own the S&P 500 index. What are the forms I can own it in? Well, I can own the physical in the correct way, but that's a lot of work. I could own an index fund, say a Vanguard or a Fidelity. You pay fees for that, and you may not have the liquidity that you needed. I could do an ETF, and there were two. There was the Fighters, which was a State Street product, and then there was the IVV, which was a Barclays Global Investors product. And so what I did is I created a model where I would own the cheapest form of the index, and I would try to replicate it using just S&P 500 index options, both calls and puts, and collar it that way. And that worked okay, but it wasn't going to give me a sharp ratio of three. It might have given me two-thirds of the market returns with one-third of the volatility, but that was the best it was going to do. And so I was frustrated because I'm trying to reverse engineer this product, and it's just not happening for me. And I knew that it was a fraud because those numbers were way, they were popping off the chart, and they were just not believable because he had a very poorly designed strategy that wasn't it shouldn't have been able to beat even T bills. In fact, with the transaction cost and slippage, I would have guessed it would have, it would have trouble earning zero the way he designed it. I just didn't think he knew derivatives math or portfolio construction mathematics at all. And do you think this was a perfect storm of being very deft at, at constructing the the affinity scheme, having that 
pedigree of being the chairman of the NASDAQ, being really tight-lipped about the strategy. It was almost as if his unwillingness to ever share any of it added to the the mystique and the how can I get my money with, with Bernie. Is this a perfect storm of a lot of different things? It's just that the scale and the magnitude of it, and, and again, the duration of it, doesn't really have an equivalent, at least not yet. <laughs> Let's hope there isn't one. But how would you bring it all together in terms of what enabled something like this to accumulate at the scale that, that it actually accumulated, given that everything you said is this was so obvious. And as we look back, you know, one of the things in your red flags document you point to is, listen, just ask someone who does the OTC derivatives, who, who's the counterparty, right? These, these were pretty easy questions to, to ask. And yet the whole thing just kept going for so many years. What are the combination of things that brought that to bear? Well, let's address the OTC issue. Bernie is saying that the reason we had people ask, well, how can we never see his volume trading on the exchanges? And the answer was, oh, Bernie's too big for the exchanges. He trades over the counter in Europe. Mm-hmm. Well, if, if you know anything about the derivatives market, you know that over the counter is like a roach motel. You can open a position, but try closing it. You're at the dealer's mercy. And the other thing we know about over-the-counter derivatives is they're more expensive, aren't they? Yes. And you're not going to get liquidity in Europe. You know, I'd be over in London sitting on Goldman Sachs' desk, and I would ask questions. How many OEX options can you trade? And they go, well, if we get an order for 100, that would be big size for us. And we would do it in 10 lots on our electronic trading system. And that was Goldman Sachs sitting on their derivatives desk in London. I'm asking those questions because I knew Goldman did not have Madoff exposure. And so they're happy to let me sit on their desk, and I'm asking them questions, and I see there's no liquidity, and that Bernie's a total fraud in Europe, and he's definitely not trading over the counter in Europe at all. Because I'm calling up the biggest desk, and they're saying, we're not trading for Madoff. Well, who's he going to trade over the counter with in the, ten, in the amount of tens of billions of dollars if he's not trading with the top dozen firms? And the answer is no one because there'd be no one that had a balance sheet that would be able to hedge that and take on those kind of positions. Did he trade a single option? No, I don't think he knew how to trade options. Did he trade equities? He was trading 5 to 10%, but if you looked at his transaction logs that he was sending out to clients, his statements didn't make any sense at all. What he was doing, his statements were designed wrong. They, he was Most statements go from left to right with a trade date, it would tell the buy or sell, the quantity, the security description, the ticker, the price that you transacted at. It extended out the proper number of decimal places, not the two that Bernie was extending out to. And it would have the amount of cash paid. And at the end of the month, you'd have unrealized gains or losses for positions that were still open. And at, if you closed out a position, you'd have a realized gain or loss. Well, Bernie, he was always crossing the month end and quarter ends and year ends in cash. So he's only in the market six to eight times a year. And he's only in the market for three days to three weeks. And so he's not holding positions across an accounting period. And I thought that was very suspicious for someone to be doing that for like 19 years, not to have any attractive trade opportunities open across a month end or a year end. Who does that? Hmm. And the answer is no legitimate money manager. And the months he's not holding a position, he's not trading, How's he earning his returns? Because he would have needed, so he needs 16% gross returns. So he needs roughly 1.33% per month. How is he getting that in the months he's not in the market? Because T-bills and LIBOR, they haven't been in the 16% range since the early 80s. And so how is he getting his idle cash invested at a 16% rate would be my question. And there were never any answers. So the thing just was never adding up. It never added down. It never added up. It never added across either. It seems like there was a period in the maybe early 90s to 2000, and you can correct me here, where the slope of his returns was higher and that he kind of amped it down a little bit at some point. Tell us about that and sort of what you think was was going on there. Were, Were there... A recognition that, oh boy, I've got to slow it down here a little bit? Yes, Frank Casey on my team spotted that. 
when the bear market hit, if you remember what March, what the March twenty fourth, roughly two thousand, the bear market started. Yeah, that sounds right. And Frank noticed a few months later, hey, Bernie's ramping down his returns because the market's returns are negative. We remember we had the TMT blow up tech, internet stocks and telecoms all blew up. NASDAQ went from 5,000 to, God, I can't remember how far it dropped. But the market, certainly the S&P dropped almost in half. And so Bernie doesn't need to keep paying these high returns. So he, his slope decreased right around when the bear market started in March 2000. He didn't need to pay as much. But if you look, in 2007, the market peaked in October. Bernie is still up. The market's going down, and then it starts puking in August, September, October, November of 2008. And Bernie's still up a hat size for the year. So he's up a few percent, I don't know, 4 or 5%. And so what ended him, he had great return. What hurt him was he didn't have a gate up, and he promised a very liquid strategy with monthly liquidity, and people were desperate for cash because the bond market wasn't trading, the emerging markets weren't trading, even corporate names and the large cap names weren't really trading well. As a result, people went to Bernie like an ATM machine and were drawing money because they were desperate for, for liquidity, and Bernie's bank balance was dwindling, and so he came up with a cockamamie excuse and came up with an excuse for his sons to turn him in. And that's how the scheme ended, at a time and place of his own choosing. And and was that fully accountable by the actual Lehman bankruptcy? How was it going, let's say, through August of 2008? Was he still in a path where he was able to preserve the scheme? Or was it just the, the, the Lehman event just set set in motion a demand for cash that, that was something he couldn't you know, possibly come up with? Yeah, whether it was Lehman, Fannie Mae, or Freddie Mae's failure, because obviously Merrill Lynch would have gone next if they hadn't merged with Bank of America. And if Merrill had gone, then, you know, how far was Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs behind them? And so it was 2008 that stopped Madoff's fraud. Otherwise, it would have kept on going and would have been really big in Asia because they really lacked financial sophistication. And obviously, they would have gotten hurt the worst because the new many investors in a Ponzi always get hurt the worst. At least us Americans and some of the Europeans got to earn money for many, many years and take money out. And so you weren't hurt as bad. But if, you, if you're brand new into a Ponzi, you don't want to be the last investor into a Ponzi scheme. You want to be the first investor in. And speaking of that, there is a very complicated unwind here. Well, f- first question is, of all the money that came in, a lot of it came right back out, essentially paying the feeder funds. But when they found actual cash, there was some in that J.P. Morgan bank account, but there was cash in different locations. And, and my understanding is that the recoveries have not been terrible, all things considered. Obviously, it's been a horrendous experience for anyone involved. But where was all the cash outside of it being paid back in performance fees to the feeder funds, where was all the cash sitting? What what did they do with it? Because even when they analyzed some of the statements, there was some of the months there was only $160 million or so in that one account. Where where was all this money? Well, obviously you had a brokerage firm in London, so some of it was likely parked there. A lot of it was with the feeder funds. J.P. Morgan's account held a considerable amount at various points in time, less at others. He also had to subsidize his trading operation, Madoff Securities, because after 2001, when NASDAQ went to decimalization, we went from spreads that were eighths, quarters, even halves on our liquid stocks. It could have been a couple dollars for high prices of liquid stocks. And the spreads went to decimals. So we went to pennyization. And he was losing money on his trading operation. And what was strange about that is, he paid his bonuses in 2001, even though his traders all lost money that year, mm. he paid as if it was 2000. And he paid them their bonuses, and he didn't make them start from zero. And everybody thought, oh, my gosh, what a generous man. Well, how many generous men do you find on Wall Street? I don't think there's a whole lot of them. And usually you don't get paid bonuses when you have losses in your trading account for the firm. And so that was a Potemkin village up there on the 19th floor. That trading operation existed to give Madoff legitimacy 
because Madoff is hinting to others that he's front-running his order flow. And the feeder funds were okay with that because they felt, well, if we're paying Bernie more than the retail order flow people, well, we should be entitled to the returns. If they're the victims, what do we care? He's paying us. And if the retail people get shafted, we're okay with that as long as we're the beneficiary of the fraud, so they weren't going to say anything. So a lot of people, especially the Europeans, thought that Bernie was front-running and giving them the benefit of those ill-gotten gains. And they were okay with that. That was their sense of ethics. And, and your sense is that he actually did affirmatively hint at that? Yes, he did. He would drop the hint. Well, I have one of the largest marketing operations on Wall Street, market making. I see all the order flow, and they're all assuming. And I know what's going to happen to the stocks and the stock market before anybody else does because of my access to the order flow. And everybody was buying that hook, line, and sinker. But where the money went, usually you're just redistributing the money. And so a lot of it ended up in the feeder funds. If you look at Jeffrey Peakauer, his estate, I think, returned $9.2 billion to the Madoff trustee. And so there's been a lot of big settlements. J.P. Morgan, they settled for $2.6 billion with the Department of Justice on a criminal, criminal fine for aiding and abetting the fraud. So there were a lot of settlements by a lot of banks uh, that paid their investors back the money. Your best situation if you were an investor of Madoff was if you invested through a large European bank, they were so embarrassed, for every euro you put in, they would give you your euro back. They mm-hmm. wouldn't give you your fake returns back, but you got your euro back. Where in America, we tend to go through the legal process, and if you look closely, I don't think the federal bankruptcy trustee, 10 years later, has made distributions yet to the Madoff victims. They've milked it for every last bill of hour, which is a very lawyerly thing to do. I mean, basically, they're parasites. You uh, put documentation together in May 2000, then again in 2001, 2005, June 2007, April 2008. On December 11th of 2008, tell us what you were feeling, how you found out, and, and you know what the next couple of weeks were like for you. I try not to remember that, actually. You take me back into an unpleasant time of my life. I can say that I was at my... Twins. I think the boys were about five years old at the Karate Dojo, about three blocks down the street from my home. It was freezing rain with an ice storm, probably the largest ice storm to hit Massachusetts in quite a, quite a while. Power lines were coming down, phone lines were coming down, and it was a wet, cold night. And I noticed two voicemails on my phone. I don't get good reception inside the dojo, so I stepped out into the anteway. And I pulled on the messages, and there were two friends of mine that knew I was working on the Madoff case because they were helping me. And one is from Dave Henry, and he says, Harry, Madoff's been arrested. You were right. It's a Ponzi scheme. Call me. And the other was from a friend of mine who was a managing director at Cambridge Associates, Andre Meta, and he says the same thing that Dave said. He said, it was a Ponzi. It looks like it's $50 billion. You were right. He's in jail. Congratulations. And so I called them both. And because this, this, this happened, I think, after the market closed, didn't it? Is that, am I right there, Dean? Yes, right I think Right after so. the market closed. Yes, yes. And so I pick up my twins as soon as the lesson's over. I rush home because I know I have incriminating documents, and I know I turned in all this stuff to the government. And I'm trying to get it to my lawyers in Washington and New York and Boston. And the problem is finding a clear fax line. You know, I didn't have a scanner at home, so it's faxing documents. And I was faxing documents to the Wall Street Journal because CNBC was reporting that there was a Madoff whistleblower. And I knew who that was. It was me. And I had a couple, a lot of people helping me. And so I wanted to get those documents into my lawyer's hands because I didn't know what the government was, what their reaction was going to be. I didn't think they were going to be happy with me. And you wound up finding, I want to say, a fax from someone who owned a restaurant? You know, I tried to get a fax there at the local Greek pizza shop. And they didn't have one. It was only for incoming orders. It didn't dial out for, you know, Greeks were pretty cheap. <laughs> we would call, you would prefer to call yourself frugal. You would call us cheap. And, but the customer was at the bar and Madoff is on the screen as the biggest Ponzi scheme. And he says, is that what this is about? Because he's overhearing my conversation with the owner of the Greek pizza shop. And he says, I'll tell you what, I'm in. I have a fax machine at my company. I'm only a few miles down the road. Come with me. So I hop in his SUV, 
and he and I spent an hour, hour and a half passing documents all over the place. And he, and then when he, he drove me back to the bar, I just put $20 in the bar and said, this man eats and drinks for free tonight. He helped me out a lot. And the rest is history. About a month later, I was testifying before Congress. That's amazing. And knowing it was a challenging time for you, you must have been just barraged with, with interest. In the book, you say you were only going to do one story, and I think it was with 60 Minutes. Is that correct? No, it's very similar, very, very correct. But I said I'm only going to do one print story, and I did that with the Wall Street Journal. And then the Wall Street Journal reporter said, you know, you're in Boston. You really should do a story with your Boston Globe newspaper because – it's a local angle, and you owe it to your community. And you don't want to, you don't want to turn your back on your local community. It'll come back to haunt you. So we recommend that you do it with the Boston Globe. So I did, and I wanted to do one TV interview, and so I did that with 60 Minutes, and that's the way I, I planned it, because I didn't want drive-by shooting form of journalism where 500 reporters call me up, and they come out with 500 twisted explanations, and I had no chance to fact check that much work from that many different people from that many different countries who were all calling. So I just sort of took the phone off the hook and didn't respond to emails from all those people. Because I wanted the story to be done right, and I felt that the victims deserved to have answers. And the only way they were going to get the truth is if I spoke, and I limited my speaking to quality publications that would allow me to take a look at the remarks to make sure that nothing incorrect was printed or made it onto the air, that everything was fact-checked and was truth, because you know, these people were losing their livelihood. All their life savings went poof overnight. They didn't know if they were going to get anything back. These people were desperate, and I felt very, very sorry for them. And it didn't take long for the suicides to start. Right. Uh, I lost a good friend 11 days later. And he slashed his wrist on Madison Avenue, and I cried for three days. I blamed myself for not contacting him. I felt so, so, so sorry for him. He was a very good person. And he didn't know his partner was corrupt and got them in the Madoff. And the guy is still hiding out in France. I think one of the things that's very clear in just the book, your testimony, what you've written, is your, your goal from the get-go has been to, was to try to avoid the fallout from becoming more and more substantial, which, of course, ultimately it, it did. But your, your efforts to point attention to something that was so substantial and had its tentacles so far and wide... No one else did it. So it's, it's really amazing, Harry. One of the things, and I want to ask you just about the business that became as a result of your chase of Madoff. One of the things that you noted in, in 2007, you had felt he was running low on funds and you pointed to some of the structured products with leverage as an indication. Can you, can you walk through what you saw in the leveraged products that went into Madoff? Yes, I saw a cheater fund on the West Coast out of San Francisco. I think it was Prospect Capital. And they were offering leverage. And people thought Madoff was legitimate. And people wanted access and they wanted higher returns. And they were willing to pay for those higher returns. And we know that structured products are a very expensive form to do anything. So it was lucrative. And those structures, to me, were a sense that Madoff was running low on funds and needed to ramp it up and was willing to let leveraged structures into his fund because he had to be desperate for cash. To me, it was a simple conclusion to make. It just seemed logical, and it turned out to be the case. So you obviously have an incredible penchant for detail and patience, really, really diving into situations. And of course, you're very, very well equipped, not just in derivatives, but this school of expertise in, around forensic accounting. What business has essentially been created through your investigation of Madoff? What, where's the career that you've essentially made for yourself? Can you tell us about what that's like and, and what you've been up to for the last you know, eight or 10 years? Yes. I had to testify before Congress and say you need a whistleblower program. Whistleblowers are over 20 times more effective than law enforcement at detecting fraud. And Congress listened, and they were game. And I talked to Mary Shapiro, then the SEC chairwoman about 35 days after I testified in front of Congress, and I showed her the statistics about whistleblowers, how effective they were, and she said, Herring, the SEC needs to be over 20 times more effective. We need a whistleblower program. 
And she told her executive assistant, let's make this happen. And Dodd-Frank was enacted in July 2010, and the whistleblower provisions were in there for the FCC to offer 10 to 30 percent rewards for whistleblowers to come forward. And as a result, the FCC is getting their biggest cases, their best cases, and so is the FBI. The FBI is actually standing up security squads in large cities, and they never would have had been for the FCC whistleblower program giving them those cases. They get the criminal referrals from the SEC. And so it's been very successful, so it's a way for me to monetize my work. So I do those cases, and and you've seen that with the foreign exchange cases that you probably read about on the front pages. Well, that all started from my work against the custody bank. I spotted the custody banks cheating on FX. They were promising best price, real-time executions, and they were waiting until the end of the day to backdate the trade tickets. If you were buying, you got the lows of the day at the four decimal places, and if you were Buying, you got the lo- the highs, the four decimal places, and I didn't think that was the best price. Well, actually, it was the best price. It was the best price for the bank, worst price for you, the pension fund, mutual fund, or hedge fund, because you were getting hosed. And if you were a really dumb client, you would get lower than the lows if you were selling and higher than the highs if you were buying, which was, to me, fairly obvious. And so I did those cases. And now I'm doing a lot of public company accounting fraud cases against financial services companies that are cooking their books. In fact, I'll be in New York next week. I'm looking for some large hedge funds that can put a lot of money to work, like hundreds of millions of dollars on a trade where I can prove accounting fraud because I think we're going to get an immediate 20 to 50 percent or more drop when the accounting frauds are exposed. And I'm seeing a lot of accounting fraud. So I'm probably enjoying accounting fraud more than Ponzi schemes, although Just this morning, I was meeting with the SEC and FBI in Boston to turn in what I think is a decent-sized Ponzi scheme locally, and I just thought somebody needed to put that person in jail. I turned in another Ponzi scheme the Friday before Thanksgiving. I think I did that one pro bono. I don't think there's any money there. It's a startup Ponzi, if you will, but it's against a very vulnerable population group in our society that needs protecting, and you know those cases I'm going to do for free, and I'll continue to do those cases for free because... I don't think anybody should be preying on the defenseless. Someone has to stand up for them. Is there, in your in your estimation, a, a cyclicality to things like accounting fraud or Ponzi schemes? Are these do these occur more in bull markets where there's more and more pressure to produce, or when people just let their guard down? Do you have any philosophical view on that, or is this just always and forever there'll be this type of fraud in, in when when money's involved? I think the best saying I ever heard was money attracts scum. <laughs> so I think it's I think that we're always gonna have predators on Wall Street. People without souls and conscience. They just wanna prey on other people, they're sociopaths, that you're just an obstacle to them, like a piece of furniture to be moved around. They want your money. Right now I don't think it's that much different. We saw the banks doing a lot of cheating leading into the global financial crisis with mortgage backed securities, liars loans. And they were packaging the stuff and hiding it off their balance sheet in mainly AA-rated special-purpose vehicles in the Caribbean nations. Well, nothing ever good happens in the Caribbean. And then financial crisis hit, and all those toxic assets come back on the bank's balance sheet, where their shareholders do nothing about that. It's a total accounting fraud. So now, I mean, I'm seeing the same thing in the insurance industry. So the banks were unregulated heading into the global financial crisis. Well, right now... You have trillions in assets and liabilities managed by insurance companies that are cooking their books. And so I'm doing cases there, and I'm looking for a hedge fund of some size to short these as I expose their accounting fraud. I think that the state regulators are woefully unequipped to regulate transnational institutions with billions and tens of billions and hundreds of billions in assets and liabilities under under management, trillions total. I also think that over half of the reinsurance sitting offshore is fake. And, you know, I'm going to go out and make some cases and turn those shorts into gold. Wherever my hedge fund partners are, I'll be in New York looking for those in the first quarter for sure. I'll be down there next week looking for those hedge fund partners. And that's what I'm looking to do. I'm looking to change an industry. I think I changed finance with the SEC whistleblower program. I know the currency traders hate me. Now there's transaction cost analysis in the currency markets, and everybody's looking and measuring performance on their trades and currency. It's reduced the spreads to the bank. So I know I'm not like there. And I'm hoping to make a whole lot more enemies in the insurance field.
because those guys need to be brought to justice too. Most insurance isn't worth the paper the policies are written on. Well, Harry and me, you have someone that was just blown away by how you approached this case with Madoff. No one else really thought to do what you did, and, and nor did they have the wherewithal, really. I think this is a indicative of just a tremendous amount of wherewithal to, to, to stay with it. And out of your work, a lot of good things have come. And I very much share the view that, you know, post-crisis, there have been some changes, I think, that reduce the at least the potential that something like this can happen again. And some of that is definitely a function of your work. So uh, I wish that was true. Uh, and I, I like to think that it would have been. 10 years ago, I probably naively thought it would be. But, you know, I, I don't have any problem finding Ponzi schemes. I've got two that should break in 2019 in New York, both over a billion. Wow. And there's no shortage. I would like to say that investors have learned that when things are too good to be true, they're not. Right. But that, that hasn't happened. I think people are as gullible as ever. I've done billions in Ponzi cases ever since then. I just don't like to take credit for them publicly because then the press bothers me. Then the victims call me and want me to get their money back. I can't do that. That has to be a federally appointed bankruptcy receiver to do that. The plaintiff's bar wants me to give testimony. I can't do that. I have a fraud practice to run. I'm catching other bad guys. Well, once I solve a case, I turn it into the government. I go on to the next case. I don't want to be living in the past. I could have charged a $1,000 an hour or whatever I wanted, really, and gotten thousands of hours of work every year for the last 10 years getting Madoff testimony. I didn't do that. I like doing other cases and putting other people in prison. And so that's what I do. There's plenty of bad guys out there to catch. I'll never catch them all. I keep raising my minimum. My new minimum on Ponzi's, unless I'm doing them pro bono, is a billion dollars. I don't touch them under a billion. For public company accounting frauds, anything under $10 billion, I don't touch. I just keep raising the minimums. I'm only capable of doing a few cases a year. I do like one to two cases a year. I don't do, and I do a few smaller ones pro bono. But one or two big cases a year, that's it. That's all I'm capable of. I work hard enough as it is, and I have a pretty good team assembled, and I just go after them. They're easy for me to spot. I wish it was not the case. I've been training other people. I've actually taken some people from the hedge fund industry in New York, you might find this interesting, that have called me in the past. I don't have time to do it anymore. And I've trained a few guys, several guys, actually, from the hedge fund industry, how to hunt Ponzi schemes. And I do the first case or two with them, and let them get a feel for it. And once I feel that they can go off on their own, well, they do. So they're sort of like my turtles, if you will. Right. <laughs> well, well, this has been a great conversation. As I said, with the 10-year anniversary of the uncovering of the fraud upon us, I, I wanted to reach out to you and reconnect. I know some of these memories are difficult just because you spent so much time trying to wave the flag and get, get folks interested. But you did a, an amazing thing, and I appreciate your time and, and being a guest on our podcast series. Well, you know, it's, Dean, it's always been a pleasure. We have great conversations whenever we get together in person or on the phone over many years. And you actually understand derivatives, and so you know the math that we discussed. I hope it all came out clear. I know some of the earlier portions of this recording might be a little bit garbled. But there's a lot of math that goes into derivatives. There's nothing in a straight line. It's all curved. And, you know, we used to do that. Well, you do that still for a living. Yeah. I used to do that. I still dabble once in a while. I do some over-the-counter derivative type cases. But more and more it's been public company accounting and, and Ponzi's. But I always like doing derivatives math. I may have to call you and ask you for some favors to look at some odd-looking math. If I can't figure it out, maybe you'll help me solve the next case. Happy to try. Well, thank you, Dean. Yeah, Harry, thanks again. You've been listening to The Alpha Exchange. If you've enjoyed the show, please do tell a friend. And before we leave, I wanted to invite you to drop us some feedback. As we aim to utilize these conversations to contribute to the investment community's understanding of risk, your input is valuable and provides direction on where we should focus please email us at feedback at alpha